Welcome to another session of Regen Civics. Last week was super information dense, so this week is going to be about unpacking all of that and diving a little bit deeper into it. But the very first step we do, but when we're starting any of these projects, is design our organization so that people know what it is they're joining. Um, and starting that off today, actually, before we do that, we have a couple general things to do. One is, are there any Alliance members here with any announcements they would like to share for projects? And I'll just leave space, and if that's you, unmute yourself and speak to it. Alliance organization updates you're asking for? Okay, well, I can share for sure. Um, there's some on this call that also can speak to what we've been doing on the Regen Garden side of things and the Permitor side of things. Um, Regen Garden is a platform and an agency to support Regen Civics projects with fundraising with NFTs. And the NFTs that we're working on are focused on utility and providing collectors the opportunity to plug in and make an impact in the communities they're supporting. And Tina here, if you want to wave, um, developed the first collection in partnership with Regen Garden. She has microbial heroes that represents the microbes in the soil. And she's using her NFTs to fundraise for regenerating gardens and solving issues like homelessness in Fort Collins. And Christina, if you want to speak to it, that would be awesome. But um, you guys can check it out at regengarden.io. And we welcome you to join our Discord and to share your ideas for your NFTs so that we can support you there. Um, and then quickly on the Permatours front, Permatours helps create experiences that attract permaculture and infrastructure development support, sustainable construction. Um, and we'd love to support the projects in this alliance with attracting that kind of help through transformational experiences. So I'll put the links for both of those discords in the chat. Thank you. Can I just interrupt and say hallelujah? There are four women on this call and four men and hallelujah, finally. Sorry. Nothing to be sorry about, Susan. Uh, I just want to say a little bit about Finca Sagrada and uh, what's going on there that uh, we are meeting uh, together weekly now to implement uh, our DAO strategy. And we're going to incorporate the new Haifa tools into our new DAO. And we're total neo neophytes in doing that. So we're like taking little tiny baby steps. And, uh, but we're gonna do it. It's just a matter of taking our time and going through each step one at a time but we're definitely going to set one up and we are working on it now. And we're also gonna have a festival of some sort next spring. And we haven't figured out exactly what that looks like yet, but we are gonna have a festival out there. Woohoo! Ooh, awesome. Uh, and, and thanks for that announcement, Sydney. I mean, uh, Anything we create needs to start with the vision of what we're creating. So art is really at the heart of this renaissance because art is what's showing what's possible. It's designing the future villages and cities and ways of life. And we're putting that in art form so people know how to coalesce around it. So, you know, having a platform for sharing that and being remunerated for it. I mean, that's just incredible. So thank you for that powerful gift. Um, any other Alliance organizations want to share before we get started today? Hey, everyone. Sorry, you can go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, Bea. Um, yeah, I just want to announce there is an active Gitcoin grant that is for um, Walla Gardens and the NFT project. And uh, yeah, it would be awesome to see just even dollar contributions because $10 contributions are much or worth much more in quadratic funding than one person giving 100. So the more people we can get there, the better. Um, and yeah, NFTs to fundraise um we're using it within the ecosystem all around so it's a win-win quick thing tina is also offering 40 percent of the sales that are generated from the microbe heroes collection to projects like all of the ones that you're all working on so we're going to have an application where you can submit and share what you're working on for the hopes of being a, a beneficiary a direct benefitter from this from this funding so Beautiful. I, yeah, everyone, I do not necessarily have an update by itself, but I don't, I haven't, this is the first call that I attend. 
I'm Bia, I'm with Sam in Traditional Dream Factory, and I'm going to start to yeah, partner with him and attending these calls with you all. Thank you. So you're be replacing Sam. Awesome. For today. Um, He's going to continue, but for today, yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, great. So I just wanted to recap what we did last week and help ground it a little bit more. And then I will pass it to Tina and she'll give an example of how they went about doing this. Um, first, I'll share my screen. Do you guys all see the Discord space here? So if you went down to org creation, um, I wanted to give one other example. And I actually did this one of the Bitcoin network because I think that's on another spectrum of what we're all doing. Because people are like, hey, you know, if we build it decentralized, we don't need to answer all of these questions because it's maybe too tedious. Um, that was one response. So I was like, okay, well, if Bitcoin was doing this, this is an example of the Bitcoin network answering each one of these questions. You know, so what are they co-creating? They're co-creating a fixed supply sound money that's extremely difficult to corrupt. You know, so that was their vision behind Bitcoin. You know, what are the patterns of co-creation is? We set up nodes across the earth and store our ledger and process transactions. You know, using a lottery model, we'll reward those who process transactions by creating blocks with new Bitcoin. So that's how, how do you co-create in the Bitcoin network, right? Then it talks about membership criteria. Who's a member? How do you leave it? Well, you can set up a full node in Bitcoin. You can set up an exchange and trade dollars for Bitcoins or something, or it could be a holder and just hold on to Bitcoins. So these are classes of membership within this decentralized network, right? Conflict evolution process. How do they solve conflict? This is huge in Bitcoin and it's called forking. So in forking, if two different versions of history exist, there's a conflict. If one person says, nope, I got sent 100 Bitcoins and another node's like, no, you didn't, that's a conflict. And this could happen all the time. So how do they resolve it? They say, well, whichever one has more miners behind it. They were asking us to basically answer these questions. Whichever one has more miners behind it, then that one's going to be the longest chain. So we're going to pick that one. So cool. That's how they handle conflict in Bitcoin. You know, how do you contribute to this community? And this is a longer one, but you can actually read this. So there's some other ways of contributing. You know, who makes decisions and how? What's the governance process? Now, Bitcoin has a governance process. It's just really complex. And that was on purpose. It was a really complex, difficult governance process because part of their vision was that hard money that doesn't really change. So if it's difficult to corrupt, in order to make it difficult to corrupt, they made it very difficult to do anything with. <laughs> Meaning it's probably <laughs> going to stay basically the same unless there's a lot of buy-in. Because in order for Bitcoin to change, you need all the, you need a majority of nodes to accept it. You need a majority of the exchanges that actually trade Bitcoin to be able to accept it, et cetera. So it's a really complex process, but in, in fact, it exists. Um, now, if the white paper for Bitcoin actually set this out and set it like this, it would be a lot easier <laughs> over time. Maybe the people who created Bitcoin didn't even assume these things and they were just creating something and this emerged over time. But the reality is, is these things do exist today. Any community where people are coming together, these questions do need to be answered, whether you're a decentralized network or you're an intentional community or anything in between, right? Um, so I wanted to kind of ground that in case people are thinking, ah, oh, some of these things are unnecessary. It's, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's really necessary to start off um, answering these questions. Okay, so without any further ado, I'll actually send it over to Tina and she can give an example of how she went about answering these questions um, for the Lala Gardens community. Hi. Okay. So yeah, we put you last night. <laughs> Thank you, Letty. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everybody over at Lala Gardens um, Discord as it's growing and growing. So basically, you know, we're an interesting case. We've come from a privately owned crisis situation. So we've had to craft a different um, mechanism. Um, guiding it into an LLC to kind of get it stabilized. And then as we're doing that as a community, actually uh, creating a, an LCA that is a limited cooperative association and, um, and, and then basically buy back the property as a limited, uh, live, uh, limited uh, cooperative association and then do the agreement structure to um, protect the land as an entity um, with its own uh, rights to succession. So here's our vision. Um, 
it's a one acre demonstration garden. It's already in process. That's what's interesting about this. So it's interesting to come together as a principle-based garden um, founded on principles of the Declaration of Interdependence uh, and through this communication style of partnerism that Neil has brought so elegantly to our table and then through the values that are proposed through the Living Institute that are gonna help all of us define and sort of agree and come into an agreement field of what regenerative actually is in a step-by-step -step process. So we're, as organizations, coming to this project as principle-based, and it's going to help inform the kinds of uh, decisions we make in governance and whatnot. Patterns of co-creation, how do we co-create? Uh, we observe the activities of the plants. A lot of what natural farming is, it's about observational based. We are natural beings within our environment. So the more we can become aware and sort of uh, co-creative and also observational within our fields, then that will help uh, to, to, for us to make the decisions we need to do. So that we're basically as a macro hub modeling an economy and in a participatory hub where all members can thrive and choosing um, as natural beings, solidarity based and thriving. Bravo. Um, Susan, yeah. Um, governance process, how do we evolve and change? Who makes decisions? So these are basically what I described before. Saving the, we're doing a step, a stepped process as a community. We're saving the property. We're transitioning to cooperative through this limited cooperative association. Um, then we're acting as a DAO uh, and coming under governed, legally held uh, as an LCA with bylaws and values and associated with that. And then developing at, once we get to the community and governance period, then we start to describe the tokenomics uh, and the Lala coin as uh, a function within the environment to support. Membership criteria. Um, we've described a couple of ways. We've got the patron yeah. members, and then we've got the investor members. And then interestingly enough, we're bringing in membership onboarding and NFT fundraising so that as we're associating with other gardens, other hubs in a more hyphal network kind of a way, we, can, we are actually building in the funding mechanism and the membership onboarding through the NFT. So it's kind of like a bottom-up way that we can vote, vet, um, ID, um, skill up, uh, have some fun and games along the way. So here we go. This is Choose Your Adventure, the Lala LCA Dow Garden Categories, patron members, investor members, Council of Wisdom, which is a really interesting, just beautiful way to, to sort of bring in the people that we have relationships with, the people that we know are doing the work, the people who have been doing the work the whole time and just need visibility in our ecosystems. And then also protecting the elders that we're associating with along the way and making sure that they are a valuable part of, um, of what we're creating. And that's, oh yeah, here we go. So, you know, it's funny when I was creating the NFTs, I ended up creating these archetypes and they were just so beautifully co coincided with the future archetypes brought by Anilos um, Smithsman. So, so this is kind of something to investigate a little bit further, but um, through the NFT, through the community, we end up sort of at these five basic uh, types that end up kind of correlating scribe tort. These all correlate and it's, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice, it's, it's something to explore. Um, the LCA Dow garden categories, we've got stewards, producers, and traders are bringing consumers in. So they too have a, a piece of how they, you know, they get to choose what kinds of things are happening here as well. And uh, NFT investors and in real life investors. And then the council of wisdom and the elders again. Lala Gardens is stewarded by the Steward Circle, a wisdom council, and um, we'll provide a link so you can take a look at who's there. I have relationships with every single one of them. They're all doing their own projects, so consider them their own catalyst hubs. And we will all be as a stewards council, a stewards circle trained in partnerism. And that will be our onboarding and our also our conflict resolution. Uh, methodology so that we're basically straight from the beginning being trained in how to communicate together and then a lot of our governance will be defined um, in line with the uh, LCA legal entity. 
and here's our team. And I will provide the link to this deck in the chat. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tina. Um, we missed an announcement, so we'll circle back. But does anyone have any questions for Tina? Just real quick before we carry forward. I have. Uh, oh, OK. <clears throat> um, maybe go for it. Stefan, and then we'll I have one very quick question. I'm just curious about your name, Lala Gardens. Lala. <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking. A lot of people ask it. I, I, I like that. So it, you, I used to be uh, Urban Acre Commons, and I had been trying to do this work since about 2015. And one day I was having a, an event in the, <laughs> in the garden, and it was getting really late, and people weren't leaving, and somebody said, I, I know it's time to leave, but I, I just don't want to leave. I don't know what it is about this place. It's like being in La La Land. <laughs> and right then I was like, okay, that's that's the garden naming itself. So from that point on, it was La La Gardens. <laughs> uh, Will and then John. Will, you're muted. Hello. Um, I saw that you train your members in regenerative communication, and there was a link to a document or documentation of what that means. And I would love to review that if you could share it in the chat. Um, and then looking at the roles that you formulated for your your village, that I can't see anyone any room in there for like the gardener and, and the cook and the cleaner and the, like the real on the ground core team thing. Um, so I don't know if you've thought about that or if there's anything that you didn't show that you can show about that. That was all. I think I always assumed that everybody should have their feet and their hands in the soil and so that those things are going to be shared by all uh, by all by all members. Um, yeah, that's that's a good I'm, I'm going to do some in, in reality. It's very different. Trust me, you want, <laughs> you want a core core team that takes care okay. of the food and the animals and the gardens and yes, the infrastructure. Steward. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, and that's actually a really a great question and response because Tina, you responded with, I kind of assumed. And Will said that, you know, that's definitely not an assumption. That's what we're actually trying to alleviate here. We're not going to be able to do all of them, but we can get the major assumptions out of the way um, in order to get that alignment. Because should it happen, you know, a year or two down into the project and all these assumptions start coming to the surface and it's like, wait, we're fundamentally misaligned that could fail a project. And again, that's why 95% of communities like coming together to do stuff like this fail is because they don't have that clear. And that doesn't have to be the case here. Um, so anyway, we'll send it over to John and then Peter, and then that'll be it for this session and we'll carry on with what we got for today. <clears throat> yeah, just a quick one. Uh, it, the, somewhere in there, there was an acronym IRL. Is that uh, stand in for in real life? Okay. <laughs> It's all <laughs> my whole question. Um, also, earlier on, you mentioned quadratic fundraising. Uh, is is that a quick answer, or is this going to take half an hour? In which case, you can skip it. It can be fairly quick. Um, it's the Gitcoin is structured that way. Get in it. They're associated with GitHub. It's. Um, it's a funding mechanism by which they do some kind of algorithms that allow for matching funding based on um, the number of, of voting contributions rather than the amount. And so you end up doing better by having a whole community basically donating a dollar than you would by having one investor donate the entire amount. So, and you can see it quite just exponentially uh, increase in matching funding. It's a brilliant way to bring value into small donations and work from a grounds up community basis for supporting projects through quadratic funding. Thanks. <clears throat> quadratic is actually the algorithm. Anyway, that's a, um, instead of exponential, but that's rude. Anyway, beautiful. The whole point is, is it's meant to give, they were using quadratic funding also for governance positions to make it so you could still buy a vote, it's just more expensive by a factor of four. 
So for every additional token as 4x less impact is one really simple way of looking at it. So if you have a lot of people giving one token, that's going to be more impact than you know a small amount of people giving a lot of tokens. Even if the token amount of that small amount is much larger than the larger group, it's going to have less impact. Um, so this is a way of like saying, hey, if we have oligarchies governance by the wealthy, how do we limit their impact? So let's acknowledge that we have an oligarchy where if it's token based voting and those tokens are able to be bought and sold on exchanges, this is where quadratic funding really came into play. As we said, we have governance by tokens. Well, that means the really rich people are going to be able to make all the decisions. Well, how do we limit that impact? Well, let's use this quadratic algorithm to say like the more that you vote as an individual person with a ton of tokens, the less impact it's going to have by a factor of four. So it's a way of like delivering more voice to the people that way while it's still having kind of an oligarchy. It's just making it more expensive um, to you know force things through, if that makes sense. Um, so that's a really complex way we can also do governance here. You can apply quadratic voting in your community if you'd like as well. Um, so I actually highly recommend that as one of the safeguards for if your governance token is able to be bought and sold, that's a really great way of mitigating the impacts of you know, a minority being able to call all the shots. Um, <clears throat> Jillian had an announcement, so I'll send it over to her. <laughs> we'll circle back around and then we'll keep going today. No biggie. I was just uh, not clear about the... Uh... And there's there's a view of my crutches. I guess that's one announcement why I haven't been here. I had a, a nasty slip and fall down a set of marble stairs here uh, a couple of weeks ago. So life has been a little interesting, <laughs> bad skiing um, setup. But um, what I wanted to announce here is that I'm uh, at Liminal Village in, e in Italy. And we had two events this past weekend. And one was uh, facilitating a day of workshops uh, for another node in the bioregional network here, about an hour and a quarter north of us. And then we had a lovely other meeting at the, the kindergarten that's in our zone one, about 10 or 11, 12 minutes away. And we had another node from our zone three come down for which we're organizing a festival. So I just wanted to give that quick insight that, and we have our, our colleague here from the Netherlands and we're really spending quite a bit of time going through this application process and there's a lot of richness happening. So, hey, from Italy. Awesome. Um, any other announcements or things to carry forward from last week before we dive in for today? Nope. Great, then I will share a link to our trusted knowledge base, which I will bring up right here in front of us. Uh, do we all see this? Yep, <clears throat> cool. So these are the questions we're gonna be going over in the breakout groups, is really trying to simplify these. Uh, Tina, I think you did a great version 1.0. Um, uh, we could actually go through and kind of break in a little bit more of the details you might need to offer. Um, for example, the how do we co-create, I love, you know, connecting it to the earth and that's how, what inspires us for how we co-create, but it also needs a little bit more practicality there, like Will was bringing up, like, okay, well, who's, you know, actually on the ground planting gardens or what's happening there? What are we actually building um, and how do people participate in actually building that? So we really want to make these questions very practical. You can imagine yourself, you're someone new, you show up to a project, you have no idea what's going on in this project. How do you orientate yourself the best way possible? If you can answer these questions, then they're going to have a basic foundation of how to participate in your project, your community, and what's happening there. So just a real quick summary again. First, they need to know what the purpose is. You know, what's the vision value? What's going on? They need to know, you know, what is the process and how we create together? Does that mean we're hopping on Discord once a week? Does that mean that we're physically meeting in the garden space, you know, these times? Like, what are we actually doing? What are we going through to create? You know, what processes do we go through to create together? So getting really tangible about what this means, okay? Um, and again, these can be really simple and I highly recommend it, but they do need to exist. Um, membership criteria. So you kind of define these, uh, Tina, but we can get a little bit clearer. So you can say, if it is NFT based, then it's, you physically have to buy an NFT. This is where you go to buy it. This is how you get membership. Or if you're voting in memberships, then it's like, well, attend a call here. These three people are going to decide if you're a member of the community or not, or whatever the case is. 
but it's how do you become a member and get really practical at because this is going to be the first question anyone asks if they're going to try to join is how do they join <laughs> but then also really important is how do members leave my baby is wanting my attention but coming with him right we now. love your baby bro don't worry <laughs> yeah <laughs> um bear that in mind Maybe somebody else could step in and um, lead us through the list who's familiar with it or wants to give their spin on it. Um, it's, it's okay. Could she pick him up. Out. She just left to go to the bathroom for a second. All good. Um, okay, so yeah, how do members leave? This is also a really, really, really important one. Um, it might be that you break community policies and you have to leave if it's a really tight community, or it might just be, hey, if you sell your NFT or whatever your membership card is, then you leave. But this needs to get really clear. And this is, again, something you don't want to have when you have that problem. Um, conflict evolution process, you know, Tina, you had those, that's great. Um, but also you want it to be really simple. I shared an example in the Discord, which is like a four-step process. Like, hey, if there's a conflict, you do this. If that doesn't work, you escalate it to B. Um, and that's a very typical way of doing a conflict evolution process is through escalation. Say step A, we try this. If that doesn't work, we go to step B, step C, et cetera. So having a you know an escalated graduated series of you know attempts at dealing with conflict, um, that's really powerful. Again, any community needs this. Bitcoin has it. If there's a longer chain and there's a conflict of the history of truth, there's a way of dealing with that conflict. So you need to be able to have this in order for a community to function. Um, Will, you brought this up, it's the initial roles. So this is what are we you know, tangibly creating in the community and how do people get compensated? And this is something to set from the outset too. Um, maybe as a community, you want it to be really simple. Everyone's getting paid the same, or maybe there's a couple different bands of how much pay you get or whatever. But how do you contribute to this community and how are contributions reciprocated? Are you paying in dollars? Are you paying in tokens? Are you paying in just gratitude and good vibes? Like, you know, what's going on? How are, you know, contributions reciprocated? So when people do show up, how are you acknowledging that, right? Um, Bitcoin has this. Bitcoin says, you know, if you want to contribute to Bitcoin and, you know, see price go up, then first buy yourself some Bitcoin and then do some great things for the community. And if those actions make the value go up, cool, then the value of your Bitcoins go up too. So that's how it answered that, you know? How do you contribute in anything you find valuable and how are you reciprocated? Well, the value of your tokens are going to increase if you do good things. You know, so that could be a simple way of answering that. Uh, and then governance process. How do we evolve and change? This is huge. Um, every community has power and power concentrations. The problem is, is if we pretend like we don't or if we're not explicit about them. It's not a problem to have power. It's a problem to not be clear about who's holding power because then it takes a, people a lot of time to try to figure this out. You know, who's really making decisions? How are decisions made? All of that. So it's really clear to have that at the outset. If you're a dictatorship, that's fine. Just acknowledge that. So when people are showing up, say, hey, we're a dictatorship. I make all the calls right now until we figure out something better. That's how things work here. Great. So, you know, how do we evolve and change if I say so? Who makes decisions and how I make all the decisions and I take input from the community, you know, if you're a dictatorship or whatever. Um, but just making that really clear. Some very basic forms could be, hey, we do consent based decisions. Don't recommend that, especially if you're looking to scale your community or we do majority voting governance on topics that are important or whatever. There might be a, a mixture of these. And as all of our projects evolve, we're going to be introducing mixtures. The best way of doing decisions is there's different ways of making decisions based on what's trying to be made. You know, some decisions impact all members of the community. Those are ones that need to involve everyone. But if you're a community that says everyone makes decisions on everything, that's going to cause a lot of burnout really quickly because someone who's focused on planting food, you know, they don't want to participate necessarily in all the conversations on how do you do storytelling and marketing, you know, and they probably don't need to, right? So you might have a way of saying like each circle makes their own decisions but we can get into that. But again, really simple. And what I recommend is just mapping what exists today. Because today with every project, there are all these things. Maybe your conflict evolution process is currently we pretend like conflict doesn't exist, but if it does, we do mushrooms together and we have a ceremony and we feel better. You know, if that's your conflict evolution process, that's maybe it needs to be improved, but hey, that's fine. Make that explicit. So we don't need to overcomplicate this, even though I know it sounds like a lot, but just, you know, map what exists today. Um, so with all that being said, I'm going to pause because we're going to do breakout groups. We're all going to have a chance of diving into these and speaking about our projects and where we're currently at and any questions we have. 
But before I do that, does anyone have anything general for the group that they feel like would be really valuable for them to take with them into the breakout groups? So maybe a particular question or something that you know you've thought about regarding this that you think would be very valuable for other groups to hear before we get going. Or if there's any clarifying questions, because I shared a lot. Again, I tend to do that. Great. If there are no questions, then I'm going to set up some breakout groups. We'll do it so there's an average of four people in the group. So we'll do five. Um, and actually, we'll do a little bit less because some people just left because they didn't want to be part of the breakout groups. <laughs> so we're going to assign automatically. Let's do four, five breakout groups. So they're going to be a little bit small. Um, just send me a message if you feel like they need to be more. And in those breakout groups, let me share this again with you all. You can bring this up and you can literally go through those questions one at a time as your community and just explore them together and say, you know, we have a hard time with this question or this is what we're currently thinking on how we do membership and just go through them as a group. So start off at one, pass it around and let everyone speak to the first question and then just keep doing that as we go through them. Um, all right, I will create the groups. And it's 1135, so I'll bring us all back in half an hour. So I'll give us half an hour to break out, and then we'll come back, harvest all of the information from everything that happened, and then end the session for the day. Um, does anyone have any changes, amendments to that flow before I kick us off? <clears throat> Great, then I'm opening the rooms. See you all on the other side. Ooh, um, so I'll wait for everyone to show back up. I just witnessed a couple slices of the breakout groups and I'm noticing my facilitation. I'm moving fast. I'm taking a lot of the stuff we've done over the last you know, seven years for granted and I'm trying to give you a waterfall of information really quickly. So I am also recognizing that we can go a little bit slower here. Um, while at the same time, maybe there's different tracks because there's different paces of what the community wants to do. So that might be what, you know, the reality of what we need to do here. So there's some evolution of the facilitation of how we're connecting here that's probably necessary. Um, I can also offer some more support because it feels like some of these things that are simple aren't simple. So there's a template that I can offer. I was trying not to offer this because it would bias it more towards how we've thought about it. But the problem is, is if you enter into an infinite space, it becomes hard to kind of create with. So here's one template I'll just go over super quickly um, that I'll share with you all. And then we'll go back and form the breakout group. So I'll share this with you and you can use this as your community to literally copy paste. It's really straightforward and simple. And it's one way of answering these questions. Uh, this is Haifa's attempt at it. And it's called the game guide. So it's a 12 slide thing here that every member when they join, they kind of look at this and be like, okay, this is how I orientate myself to what's going on here. So you go down, you go member duties, you know? So this is what it means to be a member. We said every, anyone with H voice, that token is considered a member. Anyone with an active role is considered a core member and they're earning more tokens. So it's really simple that way, right? Uh, member compensation. So we talked about that and what that looks like. Um, your personal commitment. What are you committing to when you actually show up here? And we get to look back at this. So if we do have any conflict, we get to say, hey, you know, were you committing to these things? So this is something that we get to have, you know, evolve from. So if we all commit to this, it's something we can actually look at and reference and said, hey, you broke the game guide, you know? So this is something we can go and evolve through, um, even though that's not so super generative. Uh, it talks about roles and circles and helps, you know, discuss a little bit what this actually means. So both a role and a circle needs to have these definitions in order for it to exist. Um, every circle has its own heartbeat, meaning there's three different ways of showing or processing communication, actually. And this is what DHO is about. So you know, H is the human. So you know, how do you support the human in that circle? You know, D is for decentralized. So this is governance. So like, how do we evolve our governance? How do we decide? How do we decide? And then how do we decide? <laughs> 
Uh, and then there's the operational heartbeat. This is the actual getting stuff done, which is the O of do, right? Um, so each circle needs to have some processes for each one of these in order to be effective. So this is, you know, laying that out. Talks about the circle operation. You guys can get into that more. Um, the H voice. So instead of consensus or, you know, one person, one vote or majority, any of that, we said, nope, H voice voting. And then we set some thresholds. We discussed that here. Um, and then what requires a vote? So this is super important because not every decision in your community should go to a DAO vote. That would be overwhelming and it would be a bottleneck for a lot of things actually getting done. So as a community, make very explicit what actually needs to be a vote if you have voting and what doesn't, you know? So this is a slide that helps um, set those boundaries. Um, vote scope, same thing. Lamp lighters, this is a particular role, and then blah, blah, blah. So the, real quick here, I'll send that to you guys and you can copy that, tear it apart, take what you want to take out of that and use that as a template for setting up yours if you would like. Um, that could kind of help things here and then we can all just do that. And that's probably a really good way. Uh, Tina, you guys did great with La La Gardens of just having a slide deck, some basic slides and really simplifying the answers to each of these. So what I sent you with the handbook the other day, which was like 70 pages, that's probably too intense for your communities. Realistically, it probably ought to be a slide deck of 13, 15 slides that anyone showing up can align to, right? So that's what this was an effort of that we put together here. Um, and this will probably be a great place for us to continue going today. But for now, I'm actually gonna do some harvest for the breakout group. So any questions that came up that are great for the whole community um, to talk about, put your hand up right now and I'll call on you and we can discuss them here as a whole group. Um, or if you just wanna share what your breakout group went through, any learnings that you had, feel free to put your hand up as well. Anybody? Tucker, what do you got? Um, so one thing that came up in, well, there's two things really. Um, first is a topic that was brought up last meeting um, around having a, a collaborative space for us to all kind of put the stuff that we're working on, whether that be a notion or whether we um, just have a better understanding of how to contribute to the wiki. Um, I think that's a, a pressing issue that should be addressed if it hasn't already. And I may have just missed that. Um, and then the second was the matter of conflict resolution is something that has come up in my community over the last week. And it's something that I would appreciate some support with. And I know uh, like the Regenerative Living Institute has offered support in those areas. And I'm curious um, what other projects have done with conflict resolution and if there are some templates already that exist that we could potentially um, utilize. So that, that's all. Um, conflict resolute, conflict resolution is a huge one. In fact, I actually made a whole um, channel for it in our Discord. Um, where is it? Yeah, I'll find it. Um, anyway, it's somewhere in here, I'll tag you in it. Oh, there we go. That's um, find it. Anyway, it's in there. I'll tag you. And it's worth having a whole channel about. I shared some stuff from Eco Villages um, about how they've gone through conflict evolution, which is a huge piece. And if you're not dealing with that yet, you will. And if communities don't have a process, then it's going to be a lot of pain, um, unnecessary pain that could be solved. <laughs> and let's not create that reality. Um, so yes, conflict evolution is a huge one. And there's a whole channel for it. Let's continue to discuss it. Um, as far as that shared collaborative space, Nadim and Spirit have been working on a um, notion space. And then I, what I actually recommend is that we can have all 13 projects represented there on the notion, and then they can have both their handbook and their game guide. So that slide deck linked there. So when we make a copy, then we can share that copy in our channel and discord. And then we can add them to the notion space so that we can quickly see all 13 projects, um, what they're doing with their game guide, learn from each other and have that one space to reference all of that. So then what I do recommend is just have a slide deck, um, whether you copy the HIFA one or not, which I will literally, let me just share that right here. This is a copy that you guys can make another copy of and then 
tear it apart. Do what you need to do with it, right? Um, so it's right there. And, and then share that as well as a, a template for what you guys are doing. And I think that would be really helpful. Um, does that answer or direct your questions a little bit more, Tucker? Yes, thank you. I appreciate it, Reiki. I'm gonna definitely dive into those uh, resources that you shared. Um, and here I found it. It's conflict resolution policies under regenerative practices in the Regent Civics Discord. And I sent just some screenshots out of a book that's talking about conflict evolution. And it talks about uh, one policy that one community had. And then a graduated series of consequences, I mentioned that. Um, and that comes from, doesn't matter. That's a huge conversation. We might have a separate session just on conflict evolution because it is so important. Um, and I know this again, I'm just going to keep saying this, this might seem tedious that we're doing all of this work on the outset, but I promise you that if you put in this effort at the beginning, it's going to save you a lot of, you know, heartache and trouble down the road. Um, so I know a lot of us were just like, no, nope, we want to throw up a DAO, start raising money, you know, that's what our immediate need was. It's like, yes, you can do that. And then you'll be sorry that you didn't do all of this beforehand, because then people will already show up with invested interests, with, the, you know, different visions of what was supposed to be. So if you don't have that alignment from the beginning, you're, you're setting yourself up for a lot more tension than is necessary. Um, so this is all necessary, in my opinion, before you ever raise any funds or tell people to join you to have a clarity on what they're actually doing. Um, any other, Stephen, go for it. You're muted. Thanks. Um, I'm going to put a copy of the URL for the brand new video we just made on Haifa's new tool set. I'll just put it in here for anybody that wants to take a look at it. Um, I think it's useful to explain what's in there, how it can be used. They're just rolling it out now. But for those different eco villages that are interested in uh, DAO tools and how to get their DAO going, it's, it's a, I think, a, a good introduction. And um, you guys are part of season one, so we're paving the path here. So a lot of this is really, <laughs> I, I'm very intentionally not being too prescriptive, which is I'm coming and finding out that's probably being a heartache for a lot of you. Um, but that's because we're trying to figure out what that prescription could be for the following seasons. So that other projects aren't kind of running up into this immense world of incredible possibility, we can actually start offering them a frame. Um, I actually heard you saying that, Jillian, that it's really in incredible how we're having all of these diverse ways of approaching it, but there's still an underlying pattern and structure that's emerging that's the same across projects. And that's really what we're trying to tease out here. Um, those are the gems that we're trying to look for is what is that underlying DNA that is similar across projects, because that could be the guiding template that all the other projects that are going to go through this process going forward can look to, to you know, radically simplify this process for them. So I know this is really complicated because we're paving the way here, um, but you know that's kind of what I think we all signed up here to do. Um, any other shares from the breakout group slash any questions that you wanted to ask the whole group? Well, I just wanted to share one other thing that we discussed in the group that wasn't really uh, on the list of questions, but it is more like, what does it really take among the members to make a successful eco village actually happen. And those are sort of characteristics of people, uh, one of which is um, patience with ambiguity. Another one is being able to have a, a perseverance through all the ups and downs and unexpected changes and challenges that happen as you're doing this. Uh, success comes as a result of a lot of perseverance, which is you, you, you can't really train that into somebody, you, but you can highlight it and you can, you can say to people, look, it's going to take, this is a long run. Uh, it's not a hundred yard dash. It's a, it's a cross country run. You've got to set your pace. Th that came up in our conversation.
And just for fun to riff on that, you know, I hear that analogy a lot that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, I'd like to invite that it's neither one of those. It's just life. And this is the journey we're going through. And maybe there is no end to this. <laughs> you know, maybe we're not trying to necessarily accomplish something in that sense. This is just a journey that we're all on together. Um, so in that sense, feel free to take breaks because you're not being timed. Um, <laughs> All right, how do we want to progress here? Uh, I was assuming, you know, fish in a water, you don't understand what environment you're in, uh, that this would be like a three session process to break this down for you all. And you probably already all had this thought up. So it's really just like, you know, weaving it into the fabric. But as we're going through this is actually finding that some of the projects and a lot of them haven't thought of these questions yet at all. Um, and that I thinking is actually probably really helpful then that we really brought this up. But now I'm realizing we're probably going to need some more time for this. Um, and I do think it's worth taking that time. So then what I suggest is for the next week, we go over that Haitha game guide, we rename it to our own, and we start kind of pasting in the stuff that we have for our community and the gaps that we can fill in. Any areas that don't align with you in that guide, just highlight them. Any areas that are, you know, you have for you, fill it in, et cetera, so that we can start creating a structure and foundation for what your project holds. Um, and feel free to add entirely new slides to it as well. And then we can continue going through this process each week. So we'll start it off. We'll give another example. And next week, unless another project feels ready, if you are, reach out to me and let me know. And then you can go over your slide deck. If not, I'll give an example of one. I'll, you all see Haifa. I'll make a completely different one and make it a land-based project and kind of go through an example of what they might have done um, and actually do a little bit you know, radically different from how Haifa did it. So we have a little bit more of an understanding of what's possible here. Um, and then we'll do the same thing, breakout groups and kind of go through the decks and try to, you know, refine these. So how does that feel for ongoing process? Or do we think, you know, this is fine, let's skip to the next chapter. Any feedback like that is really helpful for me on how we, you know, co-create our process here. I think that sounds good. I mean, if we make an attempt to uh, pull uh, uh, the things that we have thought about, them and put them in the order of the, the deck that you're, you've created, <clears throat> then we'll see, we'll be re really see where our gaps are. And then, um, and then I think it'd be really helpful to, you know, come to a call and say, hey, the, we have gaps here. We, it's not that we haven't looked at these questions, it's that they're hard to answer. And <laughs> we, we don't know exactly which way to do it yet. What do you think? So I think it's a good way to go. And I keep saying this, but this is super necessary. Um, they are hard to answer and we're not gonna get them perfect. We do need an answer. And that answer can be really simple. Again, like you don't, if you have this vision of a really awesome governance process where governance is you know, held in the people who are the most capable of making those decisions, et cetera, that's fine that that's a vision you want to achieve. But if the reality is today that you're a dictatorship, just say that, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being a dictatorship. Dictatorships are wrong if you're lying about it and saying you're something else. That's where all the problems start. <laughs> so just say what you are, and then we'll start, you know, we can evolve from there and we can use the governance process to change it, of course. Um, I don't recommend dictatorships. I'm just saying a lot of projects are actually that and saying that they're not. Um, just say that you are, right? Um, and then, yeah, so that's what, uh, and then after we all have a basic answer to this, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. We can move on to the next chapter, which is setting up our legal entities that make this all real, um, or at least grounded in the old world. <laughs> real is a weird word. Um, does anyone else have anything else they want to share from their breakout groups or any wisdom at all about this process, how it's going for them, anything they want to share into the space before we close today? Yeah, actually, I, I'd like to, if possible. Um, one thing that was, came up that was uh, really interesting is that we would, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in all this crypto stuff, but it's it's a, des, a design for a trustless system. And then uh, what came up in our conversation is that really what we should be aiming for first is a trustful system and then maybe defaulting to the trustless when that fails. Um, but I, uh, I thought that was an interesting concept. Thank you, and I'm going to take an opportunity to speak to that because it's so important. They say that a lot, and you know, the decentralized world is trustless. How I define that is, you know, Bitcoin doesn't require trust. Why? Because you can go and look at the ledger and see for yourself. 
So instead of trusting that a bank is like being truthful to you and saying, yeah, we have this money, you know, you require that trust. In Bitcoin, you don't because you can set up your own node and you can see for yourself. They're not trying to degrade trust, which people think like, oh, this is a less trusted environment, when in reality, that creates more trust. And how I can give an example of that, and this happened in Seeds, we had one where we were acquiring trust. You run a campaign, we're going to give you a bunch of seeds, and then we're going to trust that you use these seeds the way you said you were going to use them. So that's a trusted system, which actually creates less trust because as people show up, now all of a sudden we have to say, ooh, you can cause harm to us. And now we have to build a really strong relationship and we have to build this trust before you know, we let you have all these seeds and to do stuff with them, right? But if you set it up a different way, which is how we're doing it right now, that it's um, smart contracts that are sending it to an escrow account where they can only be used for what they said they're gonna use them for. So now you can put the seeds instead of trusting that someone's going to do what they said they're going to do with them. Now you can put them in a contract and automate that, which means we can trust people a whole lot more because now people can't cause any damage. Instead of giving people a whole bunch of seeds where they can go and sell them on an exchange and harm the price or whatever, and you have to trust them up front. Now you can trust everyone and you can let a lot of people come in and you can say, yeah, you know, run your thing because they're not able to cause harm. So then you create a more trusted environment where we're more keen to trust each other rather than less by having trustless systems, if that makes sense. So I know it's kind of like a head game here, but we're creating structures that embody more trust by not requiring trust on the onset, if that makes sense. So it's kind of a deep thing here, but I think if we can accomplish that in our communities, that's kind of our end state goal is to build more trust with these trustless systems. You know, another good example of that that relates to us is a lot of community projects get started where, love my baby. A lot of community projects get, he doesn't want me on the internet, it seems like, because I'm hardly ever on here these days. So anyway, um, another good example of that is a lot of projects might come together and say, this person, we love this person, we have so much trust in them. So it doesn't matter that they own all the land and that they could technically sell it and leave because we really trust them. So then uh, some communities started off that way and that, ends badly a lot of the time. So that scenario required that you trusted this one person who technically owns all the land to do the right thing. So even in that scenario where there's quote, a lot of trust, it's still a trustful system. It's not a trustless one, right? It requires that trust in order for things to operate. And that person could do something terrible and harm the entire community. So these are the things we're trying to get rid of. So in this sense, we would have the land actually be held by a trust, and that trust is obligated to follow the agreements of a DAO, and then that DAO has all the tokens that you can actually see on who's making decisions, et cetera. So there's a lot of process we can go through to get rid of that so that you don't have to trust that one person anymore. And instead, you can trust your own eyes. You can look at the blockchain. You can see who's holding tokens, how people voted, et cetera, which then creates more trust in that community because you that makes sense again. Um, so that's kind of the structures we're trying to set up here at each level of the way. Because whenever we have those like nodes of trust that we rely on, i.e. one person owning all the land or one person having access to all the bank account or things like that, then these are our failure points. And that's what we're really trying to mitigate with this whole process is all these points of failure that if you hit them, the whole thing could collapse. We want to get rid of as many of those as possible before we get started in order to increase our chances of success. So we don't have it so that one person accesses the whole bank account. If we're using the DAO tools, now our bank account is on chain. That's where we store our assets. And we have a way of you know, trustlessly seeing who's spending money and how they're able to spend money so that you don't have to trust three people that actually have all the keys to your bank account anymore. So these are all the pieces, again, that we're going to work through one at a time to get rid of them in our community to remove these failure points. Um, and then, of course, building more trust in our communities. So that was a huge one. I'm really glad that was brought up because that's kind of the core of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, at least if I'm trying to summarize what I believe that is. Um, that was really good. We went over, but I'm gonna leave a little bit more space for one more thing if anyone else has anything they wanna bring. Roberto, I saw that you guys went to, there you go. Yeah. Um... Reiki, going through the whole uh, list of questions, we had a few variations, you know, some things we thought can be done differently. So how do we feed them be best? Insert. 
because the answers were pretty standard. We had to choose an answer, but how do we feedback the, the variations that we have? Um, for now, just put it into your guide. Change it out. You don't have to. Mine is just suggestions. I'm giving you guys a map. Every map is false. The map is not the territory, right? Um, it's just a map to help us navigate. If you have a different map, awesome. Use that map. Um, and ideally, we actually have 13 different maps that come out of this. Um, so if you yeah. have a different variation on how you answer that, just bring that into your guide, fine. Um, and if that emerges and we see that those patterns are healthy, then we'll keep updating the map that I'm presenting, which is really my goal here, is to each season go through this, update the map that we use and improve that for the next season. Um, so what I suggest is if you have a different map, perfectly fine, awesome, normal, um, just build that into your guide and then present it. Okay, thanks. Um, anything else? Roberta, did you have something? Yeah, I feel that conversation should be open again, indeed, that trustful, trustless uh, systems, um, in particular, when you actually consider like a relation, right? Uh, that's a trustful system. And of course, with a trustless system, you, you can actually add a trustless system with it within an, a relation, but actually spoils the beauty of the trust. So it's something that uh, we need to we need to check basically at what level are we using what system in in the scale of our relationships with the community and with the global community and what we were discussing in our group is there in the earlier you use a system where you actually account and so that you don't need to trust each other uh it's it's actually a point of failure from or maybe the maximum level of below that is a community that is actually very cohesive and we can then use these tools to make sure we can be cohesive with other communities. Mm -hmm. Ooh. You know, I think every truth we're going to come to here is going to be a paradox and maybe even contradictory. Um, that seems to be how the universe operates to keep us growing is that every truth is going to be a paradox. Because what we pointed out is that when you have a trustless system, you can actually have more trust that gets built inside of that. Um, and what we're really trying to mitigate is not trust between one-on-one -on -one relationships. And that's going to build regardless. If we build a healthy container, that's going to flourish, you know, unless we take active steps to get rid of that. But what we want to remove is requiring that trust in order for the project to succeed. So, you know, trusting one person again to own all the land and do the right thing. Trusting three people with access to the bank account when the community has got hundreds or whatever the case is. You know, those are the types of trusted situations we don't want to set up, you know, or trusting a ballot box, you know, whatever has happening inside of that to actually get count your vote, you know, because then you happen in all the democracies today where people don't trust it and they think it's faulty and then they don't believe in the system anymore and then it has and then starts failing because that trust was reduced, right? So those are the types of scenarios here, not saying let's try to automate everything. Gosh, I think that would be a huge failure in every community if we tried to have everything go through the DAO or if everything needed to be you know, through the phone, or if every conflict had to be handled through this particular process. So we're not trying to mechanize everything here. We just need something and a foundation to fall back on as a community when you know, tension inevitably arises. Um, so I, anyway, that's a lot. Nadim, you've got your hand up. Let's do three more minutes because then we'll just end on the half hour and we'll go from there. Nadim. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, all of you. When I heard the first time the word trustless system or, or trustless in general, I was thinking about I don't, uh, I don't trust the, the, the community or whatever. So it is coming from the, from the blockchain space, from the crypto space, but it has a different meaning that the thing you would get in your mind the first time when you hear it, right? So it is, there is no requirement for trust because the system is taking care of it somehow. So my recommendation is for us really don't use that word here because we have people here have no idea about blockchain and no idea about crypto and they might don't need that so if we are in with the coders and in the DAO community we can talk about it but here like really it's it's a very weird word and it has this kind of a bad vibration as well this is what i feel with it. thank you so much <sighs> man, there's so much wisdom being brought into here. Last thing I'll leave you with then, because this is so important, is the words that we use. So when we're creating our game guides, don't use any words that could have a lot of different meanings. For example, community or even trustless, you know, that has a lot of different definitions. I know this is practically impossible because language is just very difficult. 
that as clean as you can, try to use very simple language and try to use a lot more nouns that aren't debatable, if that makes sense. So try to use words that are very clear, that don't have a lot of different definitions to them. Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of conflict. For example, community, that's one that we learned in a decade ago and community builders decided just, we're gonna get rid of this word because community means something different to a lot of different people. And you can find out by asking them, you know, some people community is one where your fridge is open and people can come take your food and that's totally fine and you take their food. Why someone else community is one where you have a lot of communication and you always ask for permission for those types of things. Well, community would do that. They would respect our boundaries. You know, when that happens, then it's completely a conflict. They have a totally opposite views of what community is with that relationship, right? Um, so that's what I would recommend is as we go through this guide, try to make things really concrete. Don't use things that are made out of assumptions because that's going to have a problem. Um, so the less words we use, even the better. So we're not then trying to conflate this into something huge. Very small amount of words, very simple language as we go through building our guides so that there's less room for misunderstanding and misinterpretation of what's being conveyed, right? Um, and that really helpfully way to do that is by giving examples. We didn't do this in the game guide, but I highly recommend this. So at the bottom of the guide in every scenario, give an example of what that actually looks like from a first person person's point of view. So that when someone steps into this and they're reading the guide, they get to see how they react to the community, how it matters to them and how they would you know, interact with the community based on whatever rule or agreement or whatever is being presented to them. So I know that's again, a lot, but this is so perfect. And I think exactly the right wisdom's coming to this space to help us guide us on this journey. Um, so feel free to take that and just get started. Very simple language, small amount of words, give an example. This ought to be something that we can put together within a week. So if you find that this is going to take you four weeks or however you're approaching it, you're doing it wrong. Go back and just do this really simple and mention how it is today. So don't try to like put in your dream plan. That's fine for the vision statement. Like when you made your videos about what 2030 looks like, that was a time to do like what we want to do. But when you're doing your game guide right now, it's what is it today? What does it actually look like as practically and as honest as possible? So don't try to you know, shield anything if you don't like it or whatever. So with all that being said, you know, feel free to get going on your game guides this week. Um, Discord, we can continually converse, ask any questions and co-create there. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves and we can all say goodbye and end today's session. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yep, thank you. See, See you next week. Keep going. Bye-bye. Bye, ciao.